All right, all right. Good morning, good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome. Thanks for joining us for our webinar today uh, with the Alliance of Angels. Today we're going to talk about EQ, a key determinant of entrepreneurial success, and we're privileged to have Kirk Hamilton from Vancouver, BC, to to share share his wisdom. We're with us today. Uh, before we go ahead, I just want to mention just a few logistics. Uh, we, we do ask that uh, if you are not speaking, please put yourself on mute, right? So that uh, we can have a great experience for everybody. Um, but uh, that said, if you have questions for Kirk along the way, you want to chime in, you want to participate, please don't hesitate to jump in. Uh, you can certainly speak up. That will be much preferred. If you don't want to and you'd rather use the chat windows, right, that, that will be fine as well. All right, so I'm just going to mention, say a little few words about uh, my organization. Uh, I, I run the Alliance of Angels. This is an angel group here in Seattle. Uh, every year we put about uh, 10 million into 20 companies. We have 140 angel investors in the group. Uh, most companies that are fundraising from us, they're looking for a total of between half a million and 1.5. And my typical check size is 250 to 500. Uh, if you are, we, we are a sector agnostic investor. Uh, about half of our deals are IT, a quarter are consumer, the rest is life sciences, hardware, energy, et cetera. Uh, and we are also stage agnostic. So it's never really too early to come to come talk to us. So, so if you're an entrepreneur, you're fundraising, you want to have a chat, uh, my email is here. Feel free to reach out. Uh, if you are or maybe an angel investor, you're interested in learning more about our organization, uh, feel free to do that as well. All right. So now I'm going to stop talking and I'm also going to stop my screen share and I'm going to hand it over to uh, our speaker today, Kirk. Kirk Hamilton, please take it away. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much. Appreciate the intro. Let me uh, just get my screen sharing going here. One second. Okay, everybody see that all right? Yeah, looking great. Yes. Good. Okay, thank you very much for inviting me. Pleasure to be here. Uh, we're north of the border. We're literally iced up here because we're refusing anybody else to come in. We're still under our lockdown, hoping that we'll get better as we finally get everybody vaccinated. We're over 50% now. Hopefully, uh, our objective is by Canada Day, July the 1st, that we will have people vaccinated enough. I'm hoping to open borders so that we can start doing things across the border, uh, not just virtually, but in person. Always more fun that way. So let's dive into EQ, that emotional quotient of an entrepreneur, um, perhaps sometimes the linchpin of whether a deal goes well or doesn't go well. And really what we're talking about here when we're doing a looking at an investment as an angel investor, I break things into two different elements, hygiene versus insight. And I want to spend about 80% of my time on the insight and 20% on hygiene. Hygiene's uh, really those things that you can see. They're, they're the tangible things that when you shine a light on them, they're there, they're physical, they can touch them, you can read them. But there's so much in doing an angel investment, which is the other side of, of, uh, of the equation, which is what you can see, see, which you really can't really see. Can. Um, and so when you're doing that, you've got to get an understanding. You've got to get the context. You've got to be able to, as we say, look into the shadows of what's going on there. What is the nuance of the business? What is behind the actions of what have been taken behind what's driving it? And so that's really where I come at the, the EQ element of the entrepreneur and what's really driving them and how do they help you? look into the shadows. And so we developed a little bit of a framework to do that. And uh, let me share that with you. But before we jump into that, interested in what your view is, what's the most critical element for a startup? Somebody's got to mute themselves if they would. I'm getting some feedback. And so I'm going to uh, open up a poll here on uh, that you can go into on chat. And 
One second. What can I get into? So if you want to go into that, uh, what's on this website there, www.pollev slash Kirk Hamilton 511. And uh, that poll should be active. Hopefully it is. Tell me if it isn't. And um, give me some insight as to what you think is the most critical one. And we'll, we'll jump to that. And jump to the answer on that once you've finished uh, providing me with some info. So the framework that we use to help guide our discussion with an EV to get the insight is something that I picked up from Village Capital. I don't know if you, how many people might be familiar with. They have a what's called a viral pathway that determines a, an investor readiness level for a company. And so we have really the very beginning, which is establishment of the team. We set a vision, we solidify a value proposition, moving up to validating an investable market, proving its profitable business model, and then moving beyond the early adopters, hitting some product market fit, scaling up, and then a real exit in sight, a big exit in sight. So these uh, nine levels model the, the technology readiness levels that NASA developed way back when. And I think uh, Steve Blank was perhaps the first one to identify the nine different levels like this at, um, at different, different stages of a business in terms of getting some funding. But what's more important to us is when we actually move ahead here, what is it and where is it that we, we actually can, what type of funding can we get at these different levels? And so initially with grants and family and bootstrapping and whatnot, but angel funding really only beginning when you're at that level four and level five, and then clearly moving beyond that into getting into institutional sales um, and some additional VC money and then closing for large in, uh, VC capital, institutional venture capital. And then finally, really the exits can happen at any time, but probably aren't going to likely start much before level five. And so in difference to the technology readiness levels, your, your company may be ready for an exit probably anywhere from level five up and in terms of invest, investing uh, levels. But what really does this mean to an angel investor? Because we're not typically investing levels six, seven, and eight. We're really looking at early stage investments, we're looking for high multiple exits. And that if you think of this investor readiness level, it really is something which is also defining valuation. And so it provides you with a good discussion of round valuation with the, angel, with the entrepreneur when you're conducting your own due diligence. So as angel investors, we're really, more interested at making the investment at the early stages. And so we're not so much driving, um, driving the exit, we may get there, but we're already in the company. And as doing the EQ or assessing the EQ is really all about really looking at these early stages of the business, where are they at? And does the entrepreneur understand where they're at? And so we need to have a good conversation. We need to have a common understanding of what it means to be at these different levels and how, is, how has the business evolved. We don't have the benefit of sales history. We don't have the benefit of previous investments. We don't have the benefit of lots of customers to talk to. We don't have a lot of assets and documents and things like that to look at that are defining a, a running steady state as a private equity investor would do in the business. So typically level four and level five, we're really trying to make our investments in and around that area, or maybe a little bit before that, and have a reasonable conversation so that we understand what's 
the entrepreneur thinking about what the stage of his business is. So here's your poll. Let's, before we get into it, not sure if you've been able to access this, but if you would fill your, if you've been able to access the poll, you've got the information up on top, just plug in your number. What is it that you think is the most important, most critical element, the business model, funding, the idea or technology, the market timing or team execution? Be interested in your thoughts. Let me just carry on, we'll come back to this. A lot of people put their information in the chat. Oh, okay. Well, it doesn't go into the poll very well, so I can't display that very well. We'll have to we'll have to get that get that up. Why don't you try if you can just put your information in this, and then we have it all carried together. So what determines the investor readiness level? What determines where you're at on different levels? So it's really progress on eight key attributes. And this is, I think, the, the thing that gives me the most amount of insight into the entrepreneur and where they really think they are at. Um, here we have the investor readiness chart from venture capital. It's an eye test, so I'm not gonna ask you to try to read that. And what I do when I start my due diligence with a company is I, I get them, I send this to them and I ask them to review it. And I say, well, where do you see yourself? Where do you see yourself on your team, on your vision, your value proposition, your product, your market, your business model and scale? And I get back, something like this, which tells me where they're at today. And in this case, where they're moving to within the next uh, half, to both first half of the year, second half of the year. And it gives me an idea of whether they're real or not real. And I've seen some companies that would should be at this level where they're identifying themselves at level four and level five. And I immediately go, Ooh, I think we have a disconnect here. We need to have a discussion about this. So let me go through these in uh, some, uh, some detail because we really have to assess whether there's some realism with the entrepreneur or whether there's fantasies, whether they really understand the market, whether they understand the problem that the customer has in order to craft an effective solution, whether they actually have explored and are, can articulate a business model that allows them to progress and serve their customers. So let's go through these and uh, hang on, before I do that, I'm gonna just click back. Have anybody been able to populate our... Have we been able to populate that poll yet? Okay, we'll pick it up in discussion that a little bit later. Let me carry on so we don't run out of time. Okay, so what defines a team, right? So first of all, does the entrepreneur have a partner? Do we have two people that have a complementary uh, fit? One with some maybe market customer knowledge, the other with some technology or problem solving or technology development capabilities. And how well do they really understand this problem? Have they actually lived it? Do they come from the industry that they're going to go and serve or not? Or is this just something that they've, they've dreamt up, uh, some technology they found in the lab and they're trying to find a home for it? What is it that they really know about the customer's journey? If you think of, of uh, selling, do they understand the value chain that they're selling into and how it is that it's gonna be, and they're gonna be able to penetrate that value chain? Can they actually develop some strong industry contacts that will allow them to move the marketplace? In other words, achieve the marketplace and how far down will they have to go or how far to the end user will they have to go in order to generate 
uh, in order to generate the desire, the demand for their product so that the distribution partner or channel partner that they have will actually use their product and promote their product and fulfill the um, fulfill their dream, so to speak. So the team and how well it is built, how, how broadly it's built, how much have they worked together, how much of a lived experience do they have of the problem that the customers have, the customer has is really critical here. So note that as we define these metrics from going from establishing the founding team up to level five here, proving a profitable business uh, model, when we talk about a clear sales ops understanding and strategy, that is, presumes that you have cleared all of the prior activities. In other words, you have a strong founding team, you have senior members with lived experience, you have the technical ability to build a functional product, et cetera. So when you start exploring this with the entrepreneur, what is it that you, what is it that you will learn about their knowledge of the industry and how can you probe it? How can you probe into these things that they have? For example, if you were going into a business like cars and you came out with an electric car and said, oh, well, the traditional methodology for selling cars is through dealers. I'm just gonna develop this car and see if, if I can go and sell it into the dealer channel. Well, Tesla figured out that that wasn't gonna work because those were a bunch of grease junkies and they didn't know anything about electronics or software. And so they ended up selling directly and, and totally disrupting the, the value chain that was in the car, um, the, you know, the automotive market. So when we're digging deeper into the team, what is, um, what is the experience? What if someone leaves? So are you losing a tremendous amount of market knowledge? Or are you losing a tremendous amount of, of technical knowledge? What are the dynamics? So as you explore meeting the entrepreneur, what is, how are the decisions made? Have we actually got a team here or do we have really somebody who's uh, you know, just a, uh, a demagogue that is, uh, that is uh, trying to drive the ship and, and all decisions have to be made by them. So we're looking for good team dynamics. And does the entrepreneur really realize that he has to get the most out of every team? Does he actually understand that he has to perhaps hire people that are a lot smarter than he is in order to get the best team out there? And then of course, of course, are they coachable? There's a lot of learning that goes on, not just as a startup, but in order to uh, survive and grow and really prosper, you really have to be in tune with the customers, in tune with each other, in tune with the market. So next one is the problem and the vision. And the key thing here that I'm interested in is, does the entrepreneur really love the problem or are they just in love with their solution? Have they identified, first of all, a very important problem or is it kind of a nice to have, not particularly important? Um, can the team actually solve the problem? How is it that they have shown that they have solved the problem? Can they articulate and at level three there why they are the best ones to solve the problem? Have they actually got something which is going to transform the industry? So keep in mind, all of these are progressive in, in the sense that you can't be at level four unless you have clearly completed uh, and proven yourself at level three, level two, and level one. All right. So as we move through these on um, uh, the, I'm sorry, the, uh, on the value proposition here, do you actually have a painkiller? Again, is the entrepreneur defending the technology? Is he pro providing you with information about, about the market from, from firsthand experience of talking and working with customers? Or is it as a result of hunches or reading secondary pieces of market research, et cetera? How much uh, digging in have they done? Now note here that we're actually validating the value proposition at level three. 
So that, in the case in the in the village capital's eyes, is prior to actually receiving uh, angel investment. That may or may not be the case for you. Uh, that also is going to depend on what the market uh, for investment is like. But here, if you're in a B2B uh, world, which is where I mostly play, I'm looking for an entrepreneur to actually have sold to five customers. And I've had a number of other conversations so that they're in the pipeline with a number of other customers. They may not all be identical and you may not have actually finalized the, the, the best market segment at this point in time, but they've actually proven that people will buy their product at the price that they're offering it for. So these are, these are critical progress steps that I'm, I'm really interested in, in the early stage one, because it defines the, whether or not you actually have a market, whether or not you have a product that you can sell uh, to a customer and have them use your product. The product level, well, the product level is actually one which normally I, I don't find much of a problem with in terms of the entrepreneur. Many technology entrepreneurs find themselves at level four before they've actually moved the value proposition beyond level one. And so those entrepreneurs that are in the audience note that product is only one of eight key attributes which define the value of your company. And you have to bring along or build the company as well as build the product. And that's what the other attributes are all about. And so IP falls into this category and that IP includes things like patents, obviously, it includes contracts and agreements, trade secrets and partners and data. So how are you collecting data if you're, if you're a software play? I don't know many businesses these days that aren't uh, doing or collecting some form of data because um, data is gonna drive how your business works and going forward. It's, you should be gaining that knowledge. So where are you in the development? Are you just coming out of a lab? which case you might be at level one, are you, is the entrepreneur define themselves that they have an alpha prototype, which might be a low fidelity prototype that solves the problem? Or have we actually got to one, which is a working prototype that can demonstrate the value of your solution uh, to the problem? Um, so that might be one that you've actually sold to a company and it's still a, a beta prototype with pre-production, if you will, you're not doing it at high volume, but you're at least getting it in. And so where is the entrepreneur's head about how complete the product is? Because most products, physical products, are merely an opportunity for you to provide a service to a company. There's no, if there's no utility from your product, you know, if you're not actually solving the problem that the customer has, then you've missed the, missed the mark and you have a low value product. So digging in and, and getting, the cust getting the entrepreneur to identify, okay, that's the physical product. Now what else have you done in terms of training, support, operations, customer success, engagement? How is it that you are going to ensure that the customer maximizes the value? And what's your value proposition with them in terms of receiving uh, you receiving additional revenue by delivering additional value after the sale. So does your revenue with the customer grow over time? Probing into an entrepreneur and understanding whether they get that really is critical here to understanding whether your entrepreneur is just putting a product out there that may run into significant problems because they haven't thought about the support that a customer will require afterwards is pretty critical. Market, so where are they in the market? What's the beachhead market? Can they clearly articulate what the market is? And to me, there's far too many entrepreneurs these days that are um, claiming markets. I guess the most, one of the most egregious ones that I saw recently was a company that was selling software and they were selling software to help uh, green up houses and uh, get, you know, get renovations that were going to reduce carbon, uh, the carbon footprint of the house, et cetera. 
and uh, identifying their, their market as being this trillion dollar market because it was it included all of the uh, products, you know, the insulating products and new windows and things like that that were people were going to buy in their houses. I said, but you're selling software. So what do you have to do with all this? So have you have they really defined the market? Do they really understand what the market is? And digging into that, what is their profit engine going to be? In other words, how many units generating, how much margin is actually going to make the business here? And does it result in a very large investable market of perhaps in addition, you know, a billion dollars or more in terms of potential revenue in a fully mature market? So again, we're looking at building upon these are these are progressive steps, shall we say? You have to complete step two, three before you can get to step four. And so what is it that the entrepreneur is identifying? Do they understand what they have to go through? Do they understand perhaps that if they don't have a regulatory hurdle to get over, maybe there's a regulatory hurdle that they could create that would actually give them a wind at their back. So how, is, how well in tune are they with their ability to, to grow their market by the benefit of regulation. So where is this also broadly speaking, where is it and does the entrepreneur rely on, depend on and use the rest of the, the team to provide insight into the marketplace? What is gonna be their mechanism for learning? Because we know, we know every startup has to change course uh, not only because they didn't get it right, because they don't have perfect knowledge of what, how to solve the customer's problem, but market changes, competition changes, product changes, et cetera. And so how are they gonna have their antenna out there to be able to adjust going forward? And does the entrepreneur understand that? That is one of the critical EQ questions. And the business model. The business model is going to be fundamentally wrong at first blush, but if we at least start out with an outline of a business plan, we might be able to move and uh, assess that, test it, et cetera, and move along. Can they point to other business models that are solving the same pro problem, uh, in other words, of similar products in the industry to give you evidence? So evidence means there's actually one there. It's not one that you're imagining, but it's actually one that's out there. So can the, you're in startup entrepreneurs are in the reference business. And if you can point to another one, then they'll have some realism about what it is that has to be done and how they have to uh, develop their business. Do they really understand the costs along the value chain of getting to very, very positive uh, uh, gross margins in terms of the product that they're going to be selling? Do they have a strategy to go into different, uh, to, to get to these different projections? When we talk about strategy, we're not only talk about strategy, but we've actually managed to sell some things so that we've validated that we have the margins, we have the conversion rates, et cetera, that are going to allow us to achieve the growth that we are uh, identifying in our projections for these particular models. Very critical. When we talk about evidence, these are things that are based on actual facts that you've done. So we, we do if we need to do a fact check. Does the team uh, understand what scaling is? And do they actually have something uh, that will allow them to scale into multiple markets that have a similar problem? Maybe it has some different priorities to it, but it is a similar problem that can be uh, where the, the technology, well, not even the technology, but the skills of the team can apply to the, solve the problem. And does the entrepreneur see how that is going to occur? Does he understand where the most valuable market is to start and what the most likely adjacent market is that he will be able to move into once he dominates the initial target market? So what is their strategy about scaling? Pretty, pretty critical because without, without effective scaling, 
they, they don't really have a scalable business. How do those revenues, uh, as the revenues go up, how do, the, how do the expenses go up? And do they really understand it? Do they understand the challenges of it? And can they point to other competitors that have similar business models as they're moving into these different markets? What's the team's experience in doing it? These are all critical elements of, to me, emotional quotient that the entrepreneur actually has to have. In, and lastly is, of course, exit. Does the team really understand what an exit is? Do they have a vision for it and how they're going to be, be able to achieve it? Do they understand that, you know, as an angel investor, we are looking for a return with a risk reward for it because we're investing at a very early stage, very unstable state of business. And do we, does he understand that to get an exit, he actually has to do something to trigger a liquidity event? It might be an IPO, which allows liquidity. But if you're, if he thinks that he's going to get purchased by somebody, he better be, he or she better be a disruptor in the marketplace. So they re, do they really understand the value chain that's sitting in the industry they're operating in? so that they can position themselves so they can disrupt the value chain that is there and end up with somebody who's bigger than them saying i've got to acquire these guys because i've got something that i can't do in other words it's got to be an emotional response it's got to be an emotional trigger that is either a threat to their survival or a desire to grow much much faster so it's not going to be good cash flow uh, good cash flow might be a good thing to have to go out when you're going for IPO, uh, but if the, that's uh, down the road. So again, does the exit strategy, uh, it doesn't correspond to uh, properly to the, what you're actual planning to do. If it's a strategic exit, you better find a way to disrupt them and be a burr in the saddle, otherwise you're not gonna get acquired. If it is to be an IPO, then you better find yourself to have a very big market to go after with a very strong uh, cash flow in order to, de to deal with that. So are you moving or are you as an entrepreneur, do you understand what it is, what is needed in order to generate this type of, of exit and liquidity for the investors? over the long run or are you at least willing uh, saying i don't know but i'm willing to be coached on how to get there so what does it you know what really comes out of this discussion so it's a very structured discussion around these eight different attributes and uh, by doing so what you what you find out well first of all you know does the founder really understand the company's weakness and or strengths. And if the strengths, how are they going to apply them? And if it's weaknesses, what's, what are they going to do about them? Um, secondly, if the founder can't really see their own shortcomings, then I've got some questions about whether, you know, are they really self-aware of what is happening either in their team or with their own abilities? How do they deal with your questions and your criticism of their plan? Is there a whole lot of defensiveness? Is there a whole lot of emotion? Uh, you know, it's great for them to be believers, but you've got to have a meaningful conversation and you, they've got to provide you with some good rationale for how to proceed and address shortcomings of the business, weaknesses, unknowns, et cetera. Fourthly, what's their cadence? In other words, what's their pace of learning? Um, startups have to have lots of learning processes going on. They have to test, try, evaluate, adjust, et cetera, going forward. And they have to do it on three levels, on the macro level in the market, on their business model, and on their product market fit in the micro level to ensure that they've got a, a fit for a, a strong fit, strong pro product market fit that's solving a real problem in a particular market that is big enough to go after. And so what are they doing to make sure that they are, uh, are, are really driving this? Or as is, is indicated here, are they building a lifestyle business at a lifestyle pace? 
you know, maybe a great business for them, but it's not a great business for an angel investment. You don't understand your investment is temporary and you need a return with a risk premium. So um, they're selling you some paper, which is an investment in a company and you're not buying the technology, you're buying the company. And so we're interested in building the company around these eight attributes. And we're interested in seeing how that money is going to come back to us. We need to have a plan. Just as if I were selling, uh, providing a solution to a customer, I've got a problem and I'm looking at your, the solution being, uh, being offered by the entrepreneur. I need to understand what sort of payback I'm going to have for buying your product. Well, so too does the investor have to have a payback identified for when their, uh, when their money is coming back with a benefit to them. They have lots of other options. There's a lack of transparency. So in exploring these uh, different attributes with the, with the entrepreneur, do you really uh, understand, is there a lack of transparency that's, transparency that's apparent? And then an element of poor hygiene, that is the paperwork is a mess, things aren't tied together, they're not cleaned up. This is just a symptom of a bigger management issue that things are not being looked after and watch out. So give you a thought for the day, if you don't know where you're going, you're probably not gonna get there. That's thanks to Yogi Berra who's given us this one and many other great ones. Um, so why use this uh, metric at all? Most entrepreneurs need a map to focus, to help them focus on the business. They perhaps haven't been through it before, or maybe in a, they were in a startup, but they weren't in the CEO position. There's lots of entrepreneurs that go after funding when they're not ready for it. They don't understand what done looks like for funding the different funding stages. Um, it provides an objective measure for value creation. It's certainly by going through this with, with your entrepreneur, you can have a discussion about value and really is their valuation you know, uh, correspond to the stage of the business that, that they're at. When you look at all the, the eight different attributes, <clears throat> do they really look like they are at level four when, uh, or are they really more, you know, in between two and three? It also positions, you know, something is learned by the entrepreneur in the sense that they will learn to how to grow the company capital efficiently. Uh, by making sure that they push the company as far along without uh, attracting or bringing in additional capital, they're raising the value and getting, getting better value for the share or for the equities uh, that they're offering. So if they can do that effectively at every stage of the growth, then they are making themselves ready for capital and access to capital is a competitive advantage. So, I, uh, Yogi gave us this uh, wonderful quote, if you don't know where you're going, you're probably not going to get there. But uh, also true is that if you don't know where you are, then it's hard to know where to go. Um, and so really, that's what this roadmap is all about, is you can't get out of the woods without first knowing where you are in them. And so how do you triangulate yourself out of where you are, or how do you triangulate and move yourself forward? Well, certainly having a map like the, the viral pathway that, that we are using, uh, looking at and looking at it both as an angel investor, we're also using it as a metric for monitoring the progress of companies going through our accelerator program here in Vancouver. And so it generates some entrepreneur self-awareness. It really helps you, helps them develop an understanding of the eight key attributes that drive enterprise creation and value. So moving, not just moving the product along, but actually moving the business along. In other words, wrapping uh, the engine of the car, if you will, uh, if the technology is the engine of the car, uh, giving it you know, fit, feel, and finish uh, by having a proper business model, understanding the problem, understanding um, where it's going uh, down the road. It identifies the key milestones that the entrepreneur can drive for, for value creation to allow them to be far more capital efficient. And of course, uh, for, for your benefit as an angel investor, you have a common language for discussion with the entrepreneur. 
just make sure that as you're going through the discussion, uh, that they understand that prospects or prospective customers are not customers. Customers are only people who you've sold the product to, who have paid good hard cash for the product. Even a, a, free, a freemium is not a customer, they are a user. And so thinking of, of that as you go through uh, the, the discussion with the entrepreneur, make sure that you're looking at evidence as being fact-based. In other words, people are buying or parting with their cash. And that uh, helps you really refine and develop a way of communicating and assessing where you are uh, in, the, uh, in the process and where the entrepreneur is in their process of development of the company. I'm gonna open it up for questions, please. So in answer to your slide, the, the question is the uh, slides will be available to you. I'll send them out in PDF form uh, from the Alliance of Angels. Other questions? So Kurt, there's a question in the chat. Actually, there are quite a few questions in the chat. Yeah, I'm just right. trying to go through them, but can't, I haven't seen them all. So why don't you curate them for me? So there, there's a question from Janice, right? Yeah. Uh, what about references on the team? Right. Sorry, what was the question? Uh, what about what about reference? Maybe, hey Janice, are you there? Do, do you want to just speak or ask your question? Doing. Yeah, absolutely. Doing references on the team, to me, those are, are elements of uh, the hygiene factors that you can easily check into. You know the names of the people. And so absolutely, um, when you look at their resumes, you can ask for references and go back and, and actually chat with them. Absolutely. Um, I, I think the what we're talking about here is getting more about you know, what is their, what is their uh, personality like? Uh, how do they get along with members of their team? When we're talking about insight here, that's really what we're, we're talking about because doing references is all about what they did in the past. And I think you've got to look at how the chemistry works on the existing team. So references are great, but they're, they're only part of the answer. Um, so how do you assess uh, the question from Brad? How do you access the issue that a competitor could copy the product that is being built uh, is a patent pending of interest to an investor? Um, a patent pending is, is of interest, but it's, it's I'm going to say, a fairly minor interest. It, it indicates where you're heading, but keep in mind what a patent is, is a, a patent is an application for a monopoly and in exchange for having the monopoly on that rights of, of, uh, of your invention, you are also um, making, the, making that patent, making the, the definition of that patent available to everybody and making it available basically free of charge. So people can look into that patent and find ways around it and copy it or whatever. Um, and these days of, of computers and internet and whatnot, and somebody in another country can easily find it. Like there's a business over in, in uh, uh, public business over in, um, in Germany that has taken Silicon Valley uh, developments and they've copied them and, and applied them to other countries uh, because the patents in the United States don't apply in other countries. So it, uh, they're basically just copying what's being done uh, in, in another place and doing that quite legally. So uh, patents are, are fine, but I, I like trade secrets a lot better. I've got a long, uh, big back, big scar down my back from spending a million dollars a year 
defending a patent uh, in my last business, MBS Technologies. And uh, it was ended up basically being a, a draw. So it's hard to convince me that patents are a lot of fun. Um, so do you feel the viral assessment is applic as applicable for later stage as for earlier stage companies? Uh, yes, I think it, it is uh, later stage. I'm going to say, I'm going to call later stage being more like level five. So making secondary investments, um, but it's less meaningful there. There's far more track record that you can look at on the business. You've got growth profiles. You've got you can see how their sales operations actually works, what the conversion rates there are, what markets they're in, what success they've had, churn rates, these types of things that are already there. So I think looking at what's going on in the business is a little bit more meaningful. But in this case, we're we're at the early stage. We don't have the benefit of those things uh, to see whether or not the company is quotes operating well right because in the early stages operations is all about discovery um and and are is the are the entrepreneurs that are running the business are they in tune with that's what the business needs is they need actually to do more discovery they need to be in tune with the problem they need to really work on solving the problem and finding the most effective uh solution so once you're into a later stage company, presumably they're already serving um, serving businesses and you can see how they have been able to uh, win customers and um, and then stay in the marketplace and grow. Um, personality assessments. Uh, somebody asked about done personality assessment across teams. Yes, I've seen that. Uh, I've seen that done. I don't do that uh, personally. We don't get we don't get into that much detail. I've actually seen it done more on later stages, later stage companies um, than uh, than early early stage companies. Uh, I think things are so fluid in the early stage that it's um, uh, that it's not you know it's not that valuable at, at the early stage. I think you're focused. I would be more focused on the problem and does the entrepreneur uh, really love the problem as, as Ash Maria identifies, is if you really love the problem and the entrepreneur really loves the problem, he'll find the technology people to solve the problem. He'll build the team around him to help solve the problem. If they're in love with the, the technology, then maybe not quite so. Uh, so uh, other questions, um, just trying to go through them here. Hey, Kirk, this is Darren. How are you? Fine. Um, great presentation. Uh, Thank you. you know, question I have for you is, you know, for me, it, it's easier to assess once you're in the deal, you know, whether they're coachable and, and how good they are at execution. Uh, like it, is, it seems like, you know, my experience has been, maybe I'm just not that good at it, but uh, everyone tells you what you want to hear when you write the first check. So I try to hold back quite a bit for the follow-on in investments for the ones I feel like I've, I've got more visibility into the company. What, what do you, what's your theory on, you know, in terms of your total uh, investment in the company? Do you try to front load a lot of it because of valuation or do you try to reserve some because of the uncertainty of investing in that company? I think the latter. Uh, in fact, what we would probably try to do is get to see a company before they're ready for investment and have some of these discussions with me. Now, I've, I've, I'm working with an accelerator, so we do see you know, I see some companies coming through there and, and recommend them uh, see their progress before we actually see them for an investment in our fund. But uh, no, I agree with you. I don't think it is prudent to throw all in early. Um, uh, low valuations are, are fine, but they're not the panacea. You're looking for the return. So I think you're, you can easily engage in the discussion early, maybe not, um, 
you know, maybe not you're maybe you don't make an investment or maybe you, you drag your feet a little bit in terms of making an investment and see how the company is progressing. So much depends on the business and the entrepreneur and what stage they're at. Do they absolutely need the investment right now or are they prudently going out and courting investors uh, before they actually need the men, need the money? And so I think if they're going out and approaching you, hope, hopefully, if I were an entrepreneur, I'd be starting to go out, yeah, when I'm down at level two, and I would acknowledge the fact that that's where I'm at is level two. And here's what we're doing, because you can clearly identify some milestones to be achieved. And when you hit those milestones, you come back to the, the entrepreneurs that you've courted and uh, say, hey, I'm here. <laughs> now my valuation is twice as high as, it, as I thought it was going to be. Right. Is there a certain percentage that you look at, like a total investment that you, you would want to be initial versus follow on? Or does this, is it all over the board based on the deal? It's, it's more about the size of the check. Um, you know, I'm, uh, you know, personally, I'm starting around $25,000 in an investment. So I'm a very small investor normally. Uh, but as a as a, and as a fund, we're, we're normally in probably in the 100 to 150. So we're not, and, and normally the round that's being raised is uh, a million or you know in or plus or minus uh, a bit on a, on a million bucks. So we're going in as maybe 10 percent of the of the round, maybe more, maybe taking a lead lead position because we by by taking the position there are others that will follow us and that might consume 40 percent of the round. But uh, no, I'm not looking at it. It's it's more. I mean, maybe you know, maybe the business isn't actually going to raise a whole lot of money. Maybe they can be very capital efficient the way they grow their business. So uh, I'm more interested in does the entrepreneur want to take my money and give me a, a decent return? Do they really understand how they will achieve an exit? Uh, because if they're not going to take a lot of money, then you're not going to have outside money demanding that there is an exit on the board. And um, that's that's something that you've got to be a little concerned with. All right, thank you. Um, so others. So there was actually a question, Kirk, I think an important one for you. Are you taking new coaching clients and how to get in touch with you? Uh, yes, I can, I can certainly take on some additional uh, coaching clients. Obviously, these days, it's all being done virtually. So uh, yes, I'm, I'm coaching, <laughs> coaching in a, a wide, wide range of people. Um, but uh, certainly happy to entertain and, and, and discuss uh, the needs of anybody that uh, wants to come forward. So uh, my contact information there is on the uh, is it on the website? Um, Maybe it's on the website. Uh, actually, it's on your current slide. Okay, you got is my current the book, slide. Is the email the right way to get you? Uh, email is probably a good way. You can reach out to me on LinkedIn as well, if you like. Okay. Yeah. And it's not, there's another question from Brad. Oh, do you charge for coaching? <laughs> um, I, I think that I, I do charge for coaching if my my business is, uh, is a coaching one. But, um, you know, I think the question is, if it's a long-term engagement, then I will uh, certainly do charge some coaching. Yeah, need to pay some rent. <laughs> uh, it's a question from Brett Chelio, right? I think the chat, right? About patents, follow on question about patents. Um, okay, so uh, understand concern about patents, my products and is via an internet company. Um, I haven't seen very successful um, software patents. And so I understand that this is a, a software patent. Brad, maybe you could just speak yeah, up. Actually, I think I'll speak to it. Kirk. This is Brad Chalou. What I'm really, I'm getting, I'm trying to get off the patent issue. I'm just more going through, it's an internet company building an application, et cetera, which are therefore copyable like, so are there any concerns you have relating to being involved in investing in an internet company that's building applications for people to download and use on their computers? 
Uh, no, I mean, I, I, I guess the real question is, is how sticky are the customers? Um, so why is a customer going to stay with you? Uh, how easy is it for somebody to copy what you've developed? How hard a problem does the customer have that you are solving and how effectively are you solving it? It really, okay. it, it really evolves around, around that, that problem that you're, are you solving it so much better that nobody else can do it anywhere yes. close, close to you? I believe so. Okay. But we'll so, see. <laughs> yeah. So those are, it, it's not really about the patent. I mean, the only thing that makes a patent really valuable is that you can, um, you know, if it's, if it's uh, well protected, uh, then you can have a, um, you can generate a lot of cash flow from the patent. That's what defines, you know, that was defined the, the, the value of a patent. But as I said, you know, pat, you know, getting a patent is cheap, but you're telling the world about it. And then after that, you've got to defend it. So. Got it. Got it. So that's uh, the downside. And the, the positive side about an internet company is, as you said, that it's an application that's done very, very well, um, then maybe I've got something. Maybe and and the other key thing there, I think, is how uh, how well are you or how effectively can you um, iterate on your product in order to keep your competitive advantage there? Right. Okay. Okay. Right? So Thank that, you. Thank you very much. That really comes down to staying really in tune with your customers and what the needs are and and owning a segment of the marketplace. Got that. Thank you. Thank you, Kurt. I don't see any other questions. Did we miss anyone's questions? You'd like to speak up in case we didn't address you? My apologies for not getting the poll uh, lined up properly there, but. Do you have the results of the poll? I will have to have a look here and see if I can. I, I was able to work it. It took me a while to get it to work. So, okay. See if I, what results we have here. Team and execution 58%. <clears throat> So pretty critical. Um, my, my thesis of business is that you have uh, two important factors. One is that you have a team and the second is that you have a proper framework or management system in order to organize the, the brains that you attract. And uh, so to me, the team is half the story. One of the fellows who put this together was uh, Bill Gross from uh, Idea Labs. And he came up with uh, market timing as being the most important thing. My view on that is that if you've got the right team that's really in tune with the market, that, um, that the, the, they'll pick the right timing for the market because they'll really understand uh, whether or not the customer needs are there, they'll understand the traction. And sometimes they get driven too hard by venture capital firms to take a whole bunch more money because they think it's a great idea. And so they have to push into the marketplace before the marketplace is really ready. So here's another data point. I think you guys are all pretty wise by, by picking team uh, and execution is pretty critical. Maybe that's why I chose to talk on uh, the EQ of the entrepreneur. <laughs> All right, all right. I think that this is a great note on which to, to end our session today. Kirk, thank, thank you. Thank you very much. For, for You're very welcome. Support. My pleasure. Yeah. Please don't thank hesitate you. to reach out. All right. And I know if, if folks have questions about Kirk's um, uh, coaching services, feel, feel free to send him a note directly. All right. And uh, thanks again, Kirk. Thanks to everyone for participating in the poll and, and in the conversation. Thank you to all. All right. Take care. Goodbye. Right, thank you.